hey waffle gang i do hope you are well my name is mark and today we're checking out some more relationship stories and if you do love a reddit story why not consider hitting that like subscribe maybe that notification bell too let's dive straight into today's first story from am i the a-hole exhausted wife and apparently this one has a new update to it but we may have covered this one in the past so feel free to use the timestamps along the timeline below and in the description thank you and it's titled am i the a-hole for refusing to cook dinner obviously a throwaway because my husband enjoys spending time on reddit i female 23 have been married to my husband john male 24 for a year now and recently aka five weeks ago we welcomed our first baby f i'm currently on maternity leave which my husband has interpreted as me being a stay-at-home mum instead of taking time to rest before i needed to return to work i don't really mind it too much since cleaning my house is soothing for me and a good distraction from my sleep deprivation. Lol. I've always been this way and John still does his share of household chores. He does most of the outdoor work and he'll sweep slash vacuum. But recently, he's been writing me about not having dinner ready when he gets home. He works from 8 to 5.30, so it's not completely unreasonable time for dinner. And it's not like I can just stop taking care of our daughter to cook him a meal. I can usually talk him down and he'll watch daughter while I cook. A few days ago, however, he came into the house and began berating me for not having dinner ready and waiting so he could just walk in and sit to eat. I was actively changing my daughter's diaper while he went on this rant. He went as far to say that he put up with my laziness for long enough and that I needed to do my job properly. I didn't say anything to him at that moment. I went and cooked dinner and he seemed pretty proud of himself for winning the conversation. But I only have a few more weeks to stay at home with my baby girl and I'm not going to have that stomped on because of my husband. So ever since that day, I go to my mum's house for dinner. She's totally okay with this by the way. I don't cook anything for John and I'm already at his mum's by the time he gets home. I still clean at home and keep the house tidy but I don't cook dinner. John has been furious with me has been telling me that I'm an a-hole for leaving him to staff. I just want to have a peaceful environment before I have to go back to work. So Reddit, am I the a-hole? And we're going to start off with Fortune 500 who says you are married to a 24-year-old who thinks it's a woman's job to have dinner on the table when he gets home every night. When she's on maternity leave, who raised this man? I don't want to know about the in-law situation. Does he watch Andrew Tate? OP responds and says my mother-in-law and father-in-law are are amazing, truly. I'd go to their house too, but they live a few hundred miles away. My mother-in-law was a big support for us when my pregnancy symptoms were at their worst. And no, he thinks Andrew Tate is ridiculous, thankfully. Both perspectives says not the a-hole. His expectations are wildly out of control. Have you sat down and talked this out with him at some point when he's not actively flying off the handle? Opie responds saying, I have talked with him. I told him that I'm doing my best with daughter and cleaning the house and sometimes I can't just start making dinner. He seemed understanding when we talked. He even said he would make sure to help me out. Delicious Owl says, not the a-hole at all. You just birthed a child. When John does that, pigs will fly. You deserve your time to be at home with your baby and deserve your time to heal. Do the things you find soothing, not what someone else tells you you have to do. Why couldn't he help make dinner? Opie responds saying his job requires a lot of physical labor and a lot of the time he's completely exhausted when he gets home. I'm currently on the mindset of never leave daughter unattended so he sits and plays with her while I cook dinner. I'm fine with making dinner just not with it being demanded. Jelly Bree says not the a-hole. John is entitled and needs to understand that you are going through big changes. Postpartum is no joke but you probably can't keep just going to your mum's house and avoiding talking to him. Opie responds saying that's true. It's only been a couple of days and my parents are going on vacation soon. So I never intended on this being something I do for a long time. I guess I'm waiting to see if he'll apologize. I still talk to him. And he spends time with daughter. I just am not cooking dinner. Opie also replies to someone else and says, he doesn't. This is very, very new behavior. I told him in the beginning of our relationship years ago that I wouldn't put up with unequal dynamics between partners and he agreed. I really do think something's going on at work and I keep trying to talk to him about it. This behavior is so out of character for him. That's why I'm so conflicted about it. The OP then continues with her update and says, Hey, so thanks for all your responses and all the advice on my post yesterday. John and I sat down together this evening. 
and the first thing he said was that he was sorry. He said that he was sorry for the way he had been talking to me and that he understood why I did what I did. He also told me he saw my Reddit post. Ah, oops. He informed me that there was a rumor spreading around his workplace that they were planning on laying off a lot of people and he freaked out. He didn't want to end up unemployed because he wanted me to be able to have my full maternity leave and also didn't want to force us to dip into our savings account. So he was working through his luncheon without having eaten anything since 7am in the morning, cause of the insane crankiness. And unfortunately, the rumors were true. And he ended up being laid off. So he's unemployed, which means he didn't actually go to work today. He went to his sister's house and yes, I called her and confirmed that he was actually there all day. He told me that what was going on wasn't an excuse and that his behavior towards me was unacceptable. By the way, I did reach out to my mother-in-law and father-in-law and they gave him an earful this morning. Sister-in-law did the same. He admitted that he was jealous he couldn't spend the same kind of time with daughter and that his jealousy was coming out in those ways. He's absolutely enamored with daughter and wants to be more present to bond while she's still a newborn. I told him that I needed him to see a therapist. I needed him to talk to a professional about how he's been feeling and I will do the same. We are currently looking for one, maybe a different one for me, covered under my insurance from work. I told him that until he's had a couple of sessions, I'm going to be staying at my parents' home. It's not necessarily a matter of distrust, but I believe he needs to talk to someone and be in charge of himself for a little bit. I told him that I have no intention of keeping our daughter from him, but I believed it was best to remove myself from our home for a little while. He agreed to all of these things, and my wonderful parents slash in-laws told us they'll help handle our bills until I'm back to work. So that's where we are. John is going to try being a stay-at-home dad when I go back to work and has already enrolled in some online classes at a local community college. Mother-in-law sent him some of their family recipes as well, so John is going to be handling dinner from here on out so he can get better at cooking. I understand that many of the people in the comments were telling me to divorce him or leave, but I don't think I'm ready to give up on our marriage just yet. I have a lot of people in my corner, including my in-laws. Daughter and I will be okay. If this behavior starts up again, I won't stick around and hope it'll turn out like this again. I'll go stay with younger sister. She's in state. I was recommended against leaving the state with daughter in case of the desire for divorce until I can get a lawyer. If there are any other big changes, I'll update you again. But for now, thank you and goodbye. Edits clarifying some things. One, John did not suggest being a stay-at-home dad. The plan he proposed was to pay my mum and dad to take care of daughter when I went back to work and he would look for office jobs in the meantime. I did. I wanted him to do it. Two, I'm not taking daughter away from him. I pump. I'm going to take some of the advice I was given and give myself time to rest instead of cleaning the house. Daughter will be with him too. Three, John was in fact laid off. I understand what he did in my original post was terrible, but I do not believe it warrants people saying he quit. He was jealous of my bonding time, but he also would not leave a job because of that. Four, John is overdue for a physical, so he's called his doctor and he'll have a checkup next Thursday. Five, John went to his sister's and he was embarrassed. If I was laid off after working my ass off for a month, I'd be humiliated too. I wouldn't know how to tell my spouse something like that. Six, divorce is not on the table. Divorce is not in the house. I'm taking time to heal while staying in a quiet place. Parents going to be on vacation. I'm not divorcing my husband. I don't want to be a single mum. Seven, as soon as daughter is reaching the age that we're comfortable with her being in daycare, John will be looking for jobs. He doesn't have a choice. He agreed to that. If he drags his feet, I'll start looking for him. Then OP comes in to give us update two. Another update. This one is not good. Forgive me for any errors. I'm shaking as I type this out. I was heading over to our house to drop daughter off with my husband. And I was a tad bit concerned because didn't give me a response of acknowledgement like he had the previous days. I thought that he might have fallen asleep. It didn't matter since I had a key. When I got there, John was just sitting on the couch and it took a tiny bit of coaxing to tell him to, to get him to tell me that he couldn't really move his left arm slash leg. I started to freak out because I thought he was having a stroke. But he calmed me down and asked me to drive him to the hospital just in case. I'll spare you all the details of waiting in the ER with a fussy daughter, but as it turns out, John has a tumor in his frontal lobe. 
Yet, the doctor said it would account for the weakness and for any changes in personality that might have been present. We don't know if it's cancerous just yet, since they haven't done a biopsy or anything. But I thought I'd let you guys know. John said go ahead. So that's where we are now. I'm terrified, calling my parents and my in-laws. My parents are about to go on their vacation, flying out tonight, and I encourage them to still do so, because there's still testing to be done. My in-laws will help me with daughter, watch her so I can have a little bit of alone time with John, and then I'll go home and they'll go to the hospital to be with him. Hopefully this will slow, preferably stop. The onslaught of comments slash DMs telling me to divorce him. I love John with my whole being and he needs me. My in-laws are reaching out to their relatives to see if this is genetic or simply bad luck. John keeps apologizing to me and I've been trying to get him to stop. He has a brain tumor. He couldn't control what he was saying. It's all so terrifying and I don't know what to do anymore. Thanks for all your precious advice. And if anyone has any suggestions of how I can keep myself composed during this, I'd love to hear it. OP's final update. It seems that I have forgotten about this account. My husband is fine. The tumor was benign. He had surgery to remove it. The doctor said he has likely had it for a few years and apparently he had some people in his family who had brain tumors too. He had some physical therapy after the surgery as well as some regular therapy. I did too. He's been helping my dad with his business. My dad embroiders for a living. He's teaching John how to do it to help occupy him. Daughter's doing well, happy and healthy. John has been spending more time with her. Some people sent me DMs saying to be wary that the tumor was what led John to marrying me in the first place. And well, you weren't entirely wrong. John admitted to me that he no longer felt romantic love for me. It was in couples therapy. He said that he still loved me because I was the mother of his child, but it wasn't the same he was just a few months ago. It hurt to say the least, but I was happy he was being honest. So we've amicably filed for divorce. It will be an uncontested one. I don't want either of us to be stuck in a resentful marriage, but we're going to continue living together for the time being. Walter is still so young, and John and I think we'll mutually benefit from staying close. And what an absolute ride that story was. It was up and down, all sorts of things going on. You know, he was fired, and it was the therapy, and the tumor, and once the tumor was removed, they went to therapy, and he said that they had, he no longer had romantic feelings for her, and they're getting an amicable divorce. I mean, I'm very glad that they're not arguing or anything like this at the very end, and it seems like it'd be a good co-parenting relationship, but holy moly, what a time. Now, what do you guys make of this situation? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Let's move on to another story. And a bit of a different story for our second one here, which comes from Professor Darkseid in r slash cricket, <laughs> who says accidentally wanted to impress my Esso's father. So I'm about to play club cricket for my first time ever in about three hours time. Any serious tips? And no, I'm not joking. Firstly, sorry for the shitpost community and mods. This is my old, but I'm usually a mod and I'm so sorry to ruin the sub like this. But I hope the community spirit can kick in and be helpful. Anyways, it's a 25 over game. Fifth game of the season, top of the league. My SO's family runs a local club. They're a huge cricket family. I played cricket as a teen in secondary school and only hardball up to age 14. I simply wasn't good enough. Tried to be an opening batsman and bowler. Should I just go and wicket keep? Never done it before though. Some food poisoning hit this morning and nearly half their team wiped out. I was talking big and said I could play but now they asked me if I could bat and field. My dad is pretty short but I'm even shorter so I would honestly love to prove my manliness so to speak. Sigh. Why are men such idiots? Just kidding. I'm the only idiot here. <laughs> Her entire family and extended family will be there. Sigh. I don't even think I could find long trousers, let alone a green polo. I hate green. But in all seriousness though, can you all link some YouTube videos or give insightful tips? Now there's no way I would give tips on cricket. The last time I played it, I think it was in last school and was at PE. I remember someone, they had a helmet on. And the ball went through the like the wiring on the front and hit him straight in the face, knocked him clean out. I was like, nah, I'm not playing cricket no more. But someone suggests, they says, you'll be fine. You fail way more than you succeed, so you won't be too disappointed. If you played the 14, you'll know somewhat about the game. Just say you're a specialist six who doesn't bowl. Ian Bellesque. 
defend anything on the stumps and throw your bat at anything wide. And for the love of God, do not keep wicket. OP responds then. All right, cool, cool. Now we're getting somewhere. And to be frank, my friends say I'm overhyping this way too much. I worry a lot about everything. But I guess, yeah, defend the stumps makes sense. But for the wide balls, move my feet to meet it or just swing. Also, what to go after? Spin or pace? And the reply was, move your feet if you can. But hey, beggars can't be choosers. Edge over slips for four is still four. And if you're like me, I don't understand all this terminology, but I just love the panic from OP, basically. <laughs> the next comment said, just play the V, son. To which OP replied saying, I can't tell if that's a dirty joke or a cricket term, but thanks for, but thanks for contributing anyways. <laughs> next comment says, do not carry a sandpaper in your pocket. Comment four says, God, what a nightmare scenario. I quit cricket around 14 years of age and then took it up again at the cold age of 20. I was good as a teen, but I felt like a hack. Bowling was so much quicker and I didn't have the muscle memory to reflexively play shots anymore. One thing I could do was watch the ball closely, play with a straight bat, defend everything on the stumps and at least not humiliate myself, which I'm sure you can manage. OP replies saying thanks for the tips. Yeah, at this point, I should probably lower my expectations, defend and not embarrass myself. Hopefully one day he'll ask me to play GTA and he'll see how awesome I am. <laughs> maybe <laughs> and one more comment who says you got a lot of advice and i may be too late to the party but wear a box if you want to have children in the future when you are batting in fact wear all available protective gear don't be a hero opie says you're a bit too late but you had some excellent foreshadowing thanks though and then opie came in to update the post firstly thanks to everyone who contributed whether by getting a laugh out of my stupidity or by actually helping it's all good some of you were very helpful and I tried to read as much as possible. Also, I did tell them my limited abilities beforehand. I did not lie to them. My dad coached cricket in my secondary school and although I mentioned I played under him in Form 1, one of the first times we re-met, I don't think he remembered me at all. However, I suspect this convo may have had a factor in me being asked to fill in in the first place. But to the people who said come clean, you were right and I did as soon as I got the call. Also, thanks for the goal. So the story. So my two friends and I went. I called my dad to tell about it and have a good laugh and he came later as well. We get there, we're fielding. There's seven players on the field. We three join in immediately. About five players in the correct green. One grandpa in white and one in sky blue. But overall, our mismatched green still looked green. The fielding goes okay. Certain things come back to me while other things don't. I'm relatively fit so... I'm running, took a catch, and I remembered that you need to back up a bowler, and I stopped overthrow several times. I thought catching the ball would be the hard part. It stings, and it's so easy to catch it wrong and damage your fingers. But I pocketed a catch. But I forgot about the rotation. Every time they change ends, you have to change position. And even in that over, when it switches from a left-hander to a right-hander, you have to move when the guy shouts rotate. Well, I screw this up entirely. I keep forgetting where I was and how I'm supposed to rotate. After a while, they stopped telling me and I just kind of guess where would be a good spot. The spots don't change much, but it's an important enough difference. I just kind of pretend to change spots and blend in. So at this point, I realized my SO is in the stands. She stayed home to stay with her sick dad for a bit. I get a bright idea. I'll grab water and keep it outside the ropes to mark my spot. She's looking at me, so I signal for her I want some water. She smiles and waves. <laughs> so I do the same signal. She seems to get it this time. I expected her to get her water, walk along the boundary and maybe we could hang out. Nope. She shouts from her seat at the top of the stand to who I think is her aunt at the bottom. OP needs a water. Half the pavilion who is her family is watching me now and the other half looking to see who the guy is. Lovely. The aunt now calls the captain in the field to tell him I need water. He was on the boundary nearest the water. This is going well. So during a break when I couldn't find the ball, he shouts my name and tosses a water bottle. Now there's something I learned about cricket. You need to have some serious arm strength to throw that ball from the boundary to the stumps. And he had it. I've never seen someone throw an oddly shaped mass like a water bottle so far and so high and so accurately. It was like a quarter of the field. This flipping thing is hurtling towards me and I get the bright idea to catch it. I know I have to be very careful to catch something like this. That doesn't work. 
it hits and I drop it and my index and middle of my left hurt like hell for the rest of the game. I put down a catch after that, but it was kind of hard and on my left. My water bottle marking system does work by the way. She gave me a thumbs up and smile when she saw I got the water. Thanks love. <laughs> the bowling was uneventful and expected. I got one over, all three wides all of which went for four. The other three were dots. I did the off break as suggested but I couldn't get it to turn for crap but I had a lot of pace. And I didn't know where it came from such that the batsman couldn't play or ran to the boundary when it was wide. I should mention at this point, Grandpa played as a long stop. I remember that term, and constantly had to run after my wides and could never make it. Another fielder with legs would have stopped it. No ball the keeper missed in other people's over. Grandpa could stop, and they kept in there the whole game. Needless to say, I didn't get another over. They made 150 for 9 after 25 overs. Time to bat. Time for me to relax with my girl and chat jokes with my dad. First over, wicket. Second over, two wickets. We're batting like 10 for 3. We have 10 players total. By the 15th over, we're batting 60 or 70, something for 6. At this point, I'm really hyped and I'm starting to feel the old passion I had for the sport. Screw the chatting. I go out and put on my gears with my soggy small pads with dust and two pairs of underwear because I couldn't find my old jock strap from my box. I borrow a bat and, and had my dad with me to bowl in the nets. But another wicket has fallen and they need me to go out because grandpa refuses to bat today. I have a sinking feeling I'm forgetting something. Now a redditor commented on taking my guard and I do sort of remember it. I took his advice and asked for middle. I stand properly, place the bat the correct way and the umpire helps me. I show him two with my fingers although I don't know what it meant but I remember seeing it on TV. <laughs> I used the toe of the bat to mark it out. It was already there though to be fair. Things looking good. I'm looking cool. Then it hits me. Why am I marking that? What am I supposed to put there? I have a mini panic and start to decide to test it. First I try the back leg at the spot. That doesn't seem right. I then try the toe of the bat. This seems okay. Then I try my front foot. This seems okay too, but it depends on how far away from the crease I draw the mark. I drew it on the crease line. I decided to put my toe of the bat at that spot on the crease and have the bat between my legs sorta. When I had the bat at the other end, I couldn't remember if they have another guard, but I didn't feel like it, so I didn't. Now, I forgot how fast these fellas could really bowl. I couldn't connect for about three balls, but I remember Reddit's advice. Defend everything on the stumps and only go for the wide ones off of the stump. The ball's coming super fast, but this works. Coupled with a bunch of wides, buys, and a non-striker being quality and desperate for someone to hang around. He opened. I constantly poke and prod at the ball, and we run like hell for buys, overthrows, everything. We last a while out there. Then they bring a spinner on. I hate spin. The ball spins. How the hell could the ball be allowed to change direction? Can you imagine spin being invented in cricket? Let's not charge and pelt this guy with all out might. We just walk about and rotate our arm till we fly off like a helicopter. I remember spin, you need foot movement. I don't have that. I nearly get stumped. Worse is, this so-called spin bowler is bowling pretty fast. I can't even tell which way the ball is going to turn. I still don't know right now. I hate spin. So all the time, the pitch plays very fast and low. No one is getting any bounce. Everything is staying low and fast and then it happened. Spinner sends a short one to me. It's fast, but I see it coming. But it hits a rock or the seam maybe. It bounces really high and smacks me hard on the face. Now I remember what I forgot. Motherfucking helmet. <laughs> Mind you, no batsman in the entire game wore a helmet, but I sure as hell wanted one, and I even had one too. A lovely blue one with dust that hopefully would have it. Anyways, everyone rushes to me and hold me from staggering. So many things happened I can't remember. Lots of people. My dad, my SO, the other team, Steve Irwin, I have no clue. It tastes blood in my mouth. It smacked me on the cheek and I have it under eyes for the next many, many hours. This is why I haven't posted an update until now. Going to work half day today though. My cheek became so swollen it blocked my eye. Anyways, we checked out and I have to go back today to check my eye. We spent the rest of the day at her house with all her family fawning and fussing over me when it doesn't hurt so much honestly. They constantly fret over me and there's some slight arguments about why you asked the boy to come in the first place. Whose idea was it? Why he had no helmet? 
They argued a lot about the helmet. My old man is pretty chill about everything. My SO was very concerned, helpful and caring. Once my mates were sure I was okay, they drove me home and laughed at the good impression I made on the family. And cricket balls do hurt an absolute lot. I told you, you know, the guy that got hit on the face and knocked out instantly, and that was through a helmet as well. But I also remember him explaining that bottle being chucked across the field like that. It reminded me of someone else who, you know, had a, a cricket ball chucked up in the air and they tried to catch it and they misjudged it and it hit the very tip of their finger and it just sort of like the tip of it exploded. Absolutely grim. But I quite enjoyed that story. It's a little bit different, a little bit, you know, wholesome and cheesy. I love that sort of stuff. But what do you guys make of this one? Or didn't you have a clue about the cricket stuff at all? <laughs> Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And just a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for getting involved in today's stories. Your love, your support and your time always means the absolute world to me. So thank you so much for being involved. And hopefully I will see you in the next one. Take care and much love.